Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey, what's up, everybody? Today's April 26, 2018, and you're listening to our second Human Factors Cast ACM Kai Conference on Human Factors and Computing Systems bonus episode. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, yes. Day number, what, three and four? I guess this is day number four, three and four. It's our second bonus episode and live from Kai himself, Mr. Woodrow Gustafson. Bonjour. There he is. Hey. That, that, that's hello in French just for all of you. And they Let's speak. say he's been in Canada for less than a week. He's already speaking French. Oh, man. Look at that. They, they've, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the main, the main, uh, it's it's all French here in, in Montreal. I didn't realize, so I'm, I've been trying to brush myself up on on the basics. Well, I'm glad you're getting your French refresher on, but you're also getting a ton of content while you're over there. If you're just joining us, welcome. Uh, we often pick up a lot of brand new listeners from these shows. I just want to say right off the bat, thank you for listening. What we're going to be doing today is kind of going over some of Woodrow's uh, eyewitness reports from the field, uh, live from Kai. He's going to kind of go... Uh, uh, on about his experience and and we like to do those for these bonus episodes because we have this philosophy of no human factors practitioner left behind basically what we like to do is is kind of give you an idea of what kind of content is at these conferences uh without giving away everything right so that way if these are some things that you're interested in maybe you go investigate maybe you go next year and, and make some connections uh brand new listeners we do have a slack channel that you can join us in we have a discussion going with a bunch of other human factors practitioners on these bonus episodes and if you have any follow-up questions woodrow myself and blake are all in that slack channel so feel free to reach out to us link is in the show notes all right woodrow so let's go ahead and jump into this thing so uh last we talked we covered day one and two um yesterday was day three how did that go for you uh y- yesterday was was really awesome uh it just kind of kept going man this this conference is uh is something else um and so We'll get right into it. Um, one of the talks I attended um, was on uh, what they call Telehuman 2. And it was a uh, teleconference system that uh, provided this. Um, it, it was a company that, that developed this system for um, what they call it's It's not um, uh, uh, the... What, what you would think of for um, uh, tele, teleconferencing, but it's, it's a, a way to show people, um, they use a cylinder, basically, and they project using like six different um, cameras um, a person onto this cylinder. Um, so you can kind of teleconference in uh, visually. Um, it, it's really cool. Are you saying this is a hologram of a person as a teleconference tool? Yes. So it, it ah! is. And that, thank you. I was, I was, I was really struggling with that term. Sorry. They, they don't, they don't use the word hologram. It's light field display. Oh, sorry. Light um, field is, display. Is the way, well, no, no, that, that's the way they, they, they phrased it. Now, I don't know why particularly they chose those terms, but, um, well, it, ho- hologram it is probably trademarked by Star Wars or Star Trek or something. I don't know. <laughs> probably that. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure, but it, it sounded kind of weird that they wouldn't they wouldn't really use that term. But um, but, but that's no, all we it know. Was, it is. It, it, yeah, it, it was incredible. Um, it, and they were showing the progression of. Um, so this is Telehuman two. So um, and and I apologize. I missed the the company's name in this. Um, and I'm not trying to uh, to market anything. So I'm I'm going to leave that out. But um, they had a, a initial version of this um, telehuman where um, basically uh, they were showing this this um, light field display, this hologram type thing, so that people could remotely um, teleconference in, and you can get a sense of them being in the room with you. But the the big thing about this this new um, 2.0 is they did a cylindrical version of this, and what this means is that you can actually walk around this person and stare at their butt while you're teleconferencing with them. Degree... <laughs> What's that? I said, and you can stare at their butt while you're co- teleconferencing with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Great> <laughs> I mean, think about the practical I, applications I, of that. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. Bringing um, workplace harassment no, to it, new lows. All right, sorry. Continue. <laughs> um, but no, it was just it was very interesting because the, what they were trying to do basically was um, create a a presence that the person was actually there. So it wasn't just this flat kind of screen that you kind of look at and you're talking to, but this more realistic kind of 3D version of this this person. Um, and what they said is that you know, eventually down the road, they can see these like cylinders, um, being able to, uh, be on, uh, sort of like, uh, movable. And so they, they could really, in a sense, like move around as well, just like basically a, a telehuman, if you will. Now, let me ask uh, you a couple of questions here. So, so first off, let me just say, I'm looking this up. This is by researcher at Queens university in Canada. Um, yes, thank you. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, so no no company. I, I they may have been sponsored by a company for the research, but but that's the researchers who did perform this. I'm looking at a video of this setup and the the image itself looks a little blurry. Did you have a chance to actually see the system yourself? No, they, so they didn't have a demo there. Um and and uh but but the videos that they were showing um it, it's it's definitely not like high definition video and a little bit of when you're kind of walking around it, there's a little bit of a jitter and stuff like that. So it, it's not quite, it's definitely not perfected. Um, but uh, it, it's definitely, it's showing the, the capability, right? It's showing sure. that it is possible. And basically what they were saying is the next steps are to really start improving these, these aspects of, making it as real as possible of, of getting that kind of jitter and the, uh, the shutter kind of uh, figured out and everything like that. So it, it's still kind of in the early stages, but the, 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 the practicality of it is, is really cool. Yeah, it seems like it. Yeah, because I mean, you have so many problems with trying to make televisions work, like a, especially when you're meeting with somebody for the first time and maybe you're only hearing your voice through a phone. So it's cool that somebody's really trying to bring it to life in a conference room type style, um, even though it sounds like it's a little it's got a little bit of a ways to go. But even even though Nick made some good points joke wise about like the, the weirdness of 360 degree view, I still think it brings that like more personalized element to it. So that's a pretty cool concept. You know, I think what. Yeah, and I think, oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead, go Woodrow. Ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay. I was just oh, going to say gonna... that the um, the one of the applications, uh, Blake's dying over there because we're both talking over each other. One of the applications that I thought of, of immediately when I saw this technology. So I'm actually looking up videos as we're talking about this. One of the applications I thought of was perhaps using this in a TED Talk like uh, scenario where perhaps there are uh, some limitations on where a person can go physically like maybe passport issues or or something like that but bringing this information as long as the technology supports it on both sides right you have cameras that capture the physical person who's giving the presentation and uh projectors on this light field display that you're talking about here if there's if there's that technology on the other side then you can present in like a ted talk fashion where they are presenting on a screen and, and they're actually moving around. Like you said, they're moving towards the mobile platform where they're actually able to move in physical space, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so I'm just thinking about some type of application like that. And because you get the nonverbal gestures and those are very powerful for storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think this this really has a lot of implications for, for that sort of thing, right? Is is um if if you want to try to get somebody like um, uh, someone very, very well known uh, to come talk to your university or right. um, do a, a presentation for you, right? Um, you don't have to spend the thousands of dollars flying them out and doing all this stuff. Now, granted, uh, they did show, and, and I'm sure you probably uh, see on the video or on the, the website too, that um, the, the person that's actually... Um, involved uh with this uh is in kind of a room surrounded by tons of cameras and right, right. so so it's it's definitely a very like intense setup as far as getting getting all that ready um but like you said i mean if it takes you know a couple hours to set up this kind of display instead of s spending a couple days 
traveling uh, somewhere to give a talk and everything, uh, you can just imagine the the applications that that this could be used for. Sure. All right. So, what else did you see yesterday? Um. So one of the one of the more interesting ones I saw um, uh, was uh, called Cane Troller. Um, yes. It, it, we actually talked about this on the show a couple weeks ago. Oh, you did? Yes, but I'm curious oh, to see, well. <laughs> did they give a presentation on this? Um, so, so that shows you exactly how, how well I'm in tune to the show. I apologize. He to, listens uh, to the show the right every week. Um, <laughs> um, so it, it's, yeah. So, well, just to make sure that we're on the same page here, that you actually did, it, it's, a, it's a cane that was developed to use in VR, correct? Yes. So it was fascinating. It was it was seriously incredible. Um, and, and obviously, if you if you talked about it, you understand kind of what they did it for. But to to kind of open up VR to a whole different um, t- group of individuals, right? That that probably would never uh, would be overlooked because they're visually impaired. People are are thinking, well, if they're visually impaired, what would they want to really be doing in VR, right? Um, but, but that's not the case. And so these people really, really kind of pulled out all the stops, created this incredible controller, um, that allowed people to really kind of navigate this VR system using brake stops and, um, and, and tactile, uh, vibrations and sensations and auditory, um, feedback to kind of navigate these, these, uh, virtual environments was, was pretty incredible. Right. So so the concept of this is that if if they were to bump the cane troller up against a virtual object, they would have this braking mechanism take control over the con- over the cane troller to give that haptic feedback that um, they rely on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so, so uh, l- let's be honest, it's it was a bit bulky when I was looking at it. I mean, you have to wear this kind of harness type thing. The, the brake stop is actually like on this harness, so it's it's um, uh, attached to the controller. Um, so if if you're having a hard time kind of picturing it, you might just want to look this up. But um, so so it's not like built into the to this controller. It's quite a bit of a contraption. Right. But just the fact that they were able to develop this and and what I thought was really cool was that they actually developed um, different sounds for the different types of objects that they interacted with in the real world, just like, or in the virtual world, just like you would in the real world. So one of the examples, um, was when they bumped into, uh, with their, with their cane into a trash can, it made a bit more of a hollow sound, um, where when they, when they tapped and hit a wall, it was a bit more solid. So they knew if it was a solid object versus, um, you know, more, um, a uh, hollow object or something that was that was clearly not as um, uh, you know that was movable that you could m- navigate around. So uh, it, it was it was just really cool. Yeah. So the sound technology is something that we actually didn't talk about on the show. So that's that's something new. But um, I, I'm glad to know that they actually had multimodal uh, sensory inputs for this device because. Um, or at least when they tested it, right? Because because the haptic feedback is only one piece of it, right? If they're bumping it up against an object in the virtual world, that's one piece of feedback. But unless you hear auditorily what that what that sounds like, then you don't have an idea of what that could be. And uh, you know, combining the two, you get this sort of situation awareness of what's around you. Um, like if you were to like uh, knock up against one of those street lights. You know, it might prevent, uh, produce a hollow metallic sound versus, um, you know, like a hollow wooden sound if you were to knock up against a wall. And uh, that's a very important piece of feedback that that uh, visually impaired individuals use when they're navigating the world. And, and I'm glad they took that into consideration. Yeah, yeah, no, it was really cool. And, and one of the other things that, that they talked about that I thought was fascinating was um, they were given an instance where, where they had one individual that, um, so in, in this virtual room, they also had a table. Um, so, you know, like a dining table or something. And the individual tapped into um, uh, one of the legs uh, or, or two of the legs on, on one of the end of the, of the table. And as they were navigating around the table, they ended up hitting a third leg. And 
what they said is, oh, this must be a table. And, and they were basically saying, well, how do you know that? It was a good, you know, minute or two between those different, you know, knocks and, and between the feedback. And they basically said they were recreating in their, in their, their mind, what, what that sound was. And by hitting two really close together and then a third one kind of farther away, they, they basically deduced that it was a, a table in a room. Um, so just kind of made you realize that they're, they're really spatially building this picture in their mind of what the room is like off the, the sound and the, the haptics of it um, while they're actually navigating this room, which, which I just uh, found pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, we both found this really fascinating when we were talking about this on the show a couple of weeks ago, but I'm glad that you were actually there to hear these people talk about this in person because this was one that, really piqued our interest at least um, because we're always kind of looking for these unique input methodologies or, or feedback mechanisms um, that are novel and offer either new avenues of accessibility for individuals or offer an entirely new paradigm for interacting with uh, our world, um, whether that be through the digital medium or virtual environments or whatever it is. So, um, Excellent. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you got to see this. Uh, what else did you see there on day three? Uh, so one of the other things, and again, I'll go uh, go VR here a bit because uh, honestly, that was uh, there was a lot there at that conference on, <laughs> on VR. Um, Why wasn't they, I there? They call, that, they, they call it the haptic revolver. Um, Ooh. Yeah, love the name. Uh, basically, what they did was they took a um, and and. Uh, I'm not, I, I can't remember which type of uh, controller they used, um, but they they basically took one of the, the um, VR controllers and they attached in front of it this wheel um, that you basically stuck your pointer finger out and the wheel um, turned in a fashion that gave you both uh, a touch sense, uh, sensation, um, shear and texture um uh, feedback for using in VR. Um, and so let me, let me try to explain this a little bit. And again, this might be something that you might need to look up, uh, because some of this stuff is very hard to kind of describe in, um, over a, <laughs> over a podcast, over but, an auditory medium. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, but it, it was really cool because basically what they did is, is they had this, this mechanism that, when they were interacting with the virtual world and one of the use cases uh, where they were showing a poker table and when you rubbed your finger on the felt table, the revolver uh, was spinning on a, on a portion of, of the, the wheel that was covered in felt. And so as you were moving your finger across the table horizontally, the, the wheel would spin and you would feel the felt on your fingertip, right? You guys, yeah, I'm I'm tracking. So so just to reiterate, uh, as you kind of control your finger to put it down on this virtual felt table and move it along, the wheel replicates the movement along the table, so that way it feels like your hand is then gliding over the felt surface of the virtual table. That's correct. Um, and so it was really cool because basically it's it's out of the way, so it's it's actually down below your fingertip until you actually in the virtual world, touch that surface. And then it actually sh moves up to give you that touch sensation. And then if you move your finger side to side, it'll start turning and give you that, that, um, that sheer force, um, feeling of you're moving across a surface. Um, that's interesting. So it's like attenuating to where your finger is in space, but I guess also at the same time, kind of talking to what's going on in the VR headset to make to know that you're like looking at the felt table or close enough to touch it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's purely uh, using, I believe, the um, the X, Y, and Z axes of the the virtual controller um, in relation to how it's how it's manipulating the the wheel on that to know if you're actually touching it or not. Um, but that, that wasn't the only thing that was really cool. The other, the other part is basically they were also showing instances of using different textures within the same wheel. And so if on this poker table, say you, you put your finger down on a, on a 
card on the table, they had a little piece on the wheel that was a piece of plastic, kind of like a, a, the, the feeling of a, of a plastic a playing card. And the wheel would actually automatically uh, turn to that uh, portion of the wheel so that when you went and touched the card, it was a plastic feel uh, on your finger, not, not the felt. Um, and it knew, it knew where the card was in the virtual world and where your finger went to touch it. It would automatically adjust the wheel um, so that you were touching the plastic. So that's interesting to me for a variety of reasons. Um, you mentioned in the first example, they would run their finger over this virtual felt table and the wheel would rotate, allowing them to sort of feel that movement. Um, and now with this multi-wheel, you can't do that because a portion of the multi-wheel is dedicated to sort of this this card and then another portion of it to the poker chip and another portion of it to the felt. And you can't get that continuous motion, right? Or, or did they have a solution no, to that? Th they did have a solution, and it was ingenious. So what they did is that they actually, when you got up to, uh, so, so think of when you're, when you're sliding your finger across horizontally and you're, you're coming up on the portion of the wheel to like one of the other features like a card, right? The plastic. Right. It would actually, uh, if you were still scrolling uh, with your finger horizontally, it would actually shift the rotation of the wheel and go in the opposite direction. And the majority of people couldn't actually tell that it had changed direction. Ah. Oh, I'm kind of surprised that people wouldn't be able to feel like a, a directional shift, but obviously it must be smooth they, enough that it just feels so, real. So they could, yeah, the majority of people okay. could tell the shift. So, so that was one thing that was one of the limitations of their, of their findings is people could tell like a, an automatic shift, right? Of if you're scrolling, all of a sudden it shift and then go in the opposite direction, they could feel the, the change in shift, but what they couldn't, but the majority of people couldn't do was if you, uh, purposely change the direction, um, opposite when you were starting off, they, they actually were having a hard time figuring out if it was actually going in the correct direction or not from the start. Um, hmm. which, so, so it, it just gave a really good insight into, um, tactile feedback and how much we actually rely on visual cues to actually understand what we're, um, what we're feeling, what we're touching and how we're interacting with the world, um, really, really helps with those, with those extra cues we have. Right. This is this is an interesting project because I mean we've seen projects where they're they're trying to give haptic feedback, um, but uh, oftentimes like we've seen that glove, right? The the spider glove that looks like a pair of spider legs coming over your hand that basically prevents you from um, f from completing a grab or something because mm -hmm. in the virtual environment the object is there and so the spider it's glove. Solid pulls back your fingers to make it feel like you're holding something in your hand. Now, what that doesn't emulate is things like weight or surface texture. And this is trying to accomplish one of those, right? And so it'll be interesting if we ever get to a point where we're able to mask um, all three of these things, both weight of an object in a virtual environment, you have the haptic feedback itself, and the, the texture component that we're talking about here in the haptic revolver. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm really glad you you mentioned some of those because I actually have something in day four that that uh, has something a little bit to do with with some of that stuff. So um, I will uh, I will do that as a little foreshadowing for all the listeners to to have them continue listening because uh, yeah, there's something else that someone else did that uh, that actually addressed some of those issues. I don't know. We're 24 minutes in. If they're already listening, I'm pretty sure they're invested. All right. So so haptic <laughs> revolver. What 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 else did we have on day three? Um, okay, so uh, two things that were not um, talk related um, that I thought was really cool is um, I got to meet uh, the senior research um, uh, Danielle Fisher at Microsoft Research, who specializes in information and data visualizations. Ooh, so, that's awesome! Uh, Ed, yeah, so Edward Tufty, move over, son, uh, because <laughs> there's a new boy in town. Um, <laughs> but no. It, he was actually, he was super cool. Um, and what was even better was I actually got a book called Making Data Visual. Um, uh, and, and I got a free uh, signed copy from him. Um, 
and it's basically a practical guide to using visualization for insight. Um, so we all know how important visualizing kind of information is um, to our job, but also to, um, you know, for uh, presenting information to our, our stakeholders, our customers. Um, and so I, I'm really excited about this uh, this book because I think it's, it's going to be tremendous to kind of look over. I haven't really had a chance to to look it over that much, but um, well, you're at a I'm conference. just really excited to do. <laughs> you're at a conference. I wouldn't have expected you to look over that book in, in the time that you, you're there. You're busy doing other things. So that was, that's a pretty cool connection. It's, it's always – so for some of our listeners who may be in grad school or haven't gone to a, a conference before, it's um, – Half the battle is actually going to these uh, these talks and these demos that Woodrow has been reporting on. But the other half of it is networking with people that are influential in the field or that have similar interests to you that could potentially be a working partner with you later on. And uh, that that's a big part of it. And I know at least a lot of students who are just entering grad school who have never been to one of these things, that's one thing that they have difficulty with or, or they don't know really how to network at these events. Do you have any sort of takeaways uh, for, for maybe some of our junior listeners? Um, I say junior, not as a derogatory term, but as someone who is just getting into the field, right? Uh, do you have any tips for them for networking at some types of these events? Um, yes. Uh, I, I mean, honestly, the biggest thing is, is have no fear. And that's, that's very easy to say hard to do. Right. Yeah. But I, but uh, in reality, I mean, these people are professionals, right? They're, they're not, if, if you go up to them, you got to have some sort of confidence and just talk to people, um, which I know for a lot of, for some people, it's, it's very hard to do as someone who's spent um, better part of a decade um, in customer service as myself. Um, I, I don't find it as hard, uh, but it, it's just one of those things where pe- people are there, they want to talk, they want to talk and they want to talk about the research. They want to talk about what they do. And so all you need to really do is introduce yourself, kind of give them them that opening and they will just talk forever. Um, well, if you get the right person, and, some people, some people are just as awkward as you are, or you can be, I don't know. I'm speaking from experience here. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Some people, some people can, right. But I mean, I'm talking about these kind of, especially the bigger name people right out there that you read in books that are authors that, um, you know, you follow their work. Um, these people, while you may be kind of hesitant to, to approach them, the majority of these people, I mean, once you start talking to them, they, they just have this passion. They love telling people what they do. They love passing on that knowledge. Um, so, I mean, honestly, the biggest takeaway is just don't be afraid. Just go talk to people. Um, you know, it breaks are, are a great way to do that. Um, when you're at a break, always, you know, try to go, you know, stand or, or sit at a table where, where other people are at and just introduce yourself. Um, you know, try to, try to go out there, um, and try to always, you know, sit with different people. Don't, don't keep going back to the same people that you meet. Um, you know, try your best to kind of, um, uh, do the network, do the real networking type. Yeah. I had a real surreal moment at HFES uh, a couple years ago. I found myself, uh, in the urinal, urinal next to Chris Wickens. Uh, no conversation was struck up, but I mean, we later met later that night. Uh, I didn't bring up the urinal conversation later. Uh, I just, I just thought it was funny at the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's well, so, I mean, that's, that's one way. I mean, if, if you say you're shy, but you met someone in the urinal, I don't think you're really that shy. No, I, I'm I mean, saying so that, I that's didn't a little bit of a, a I didn't talk to him in the urinal. I'm just saying oh. it was a situation that happened, and then I ended up talking to him later that night. It's just it's was it was it at was it at, hey uh, was that, it at the uh, the the Harvey thing? Yeah, that was in DC. That was in DC. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I met yeah I met him that night too, and I, I have to say too, I was a little bit in shell shock because yeah, he's kind of a uh, an icon in our in our field. And, yeah, and, people and still honest, cite him from like papers in the eighties. Like yeah. it's twenty eighteen. Yeah. Yeah. Um no, I, I know what you're saying though, Nick, because people like that though, when I met him too, I was I was kind of like uh befumbled and, and just kinda like uh shaking when I was like, Hey, how you doing? Oh you he's know? talking to um, me. Yeah, it happens. It's weird. It's a real yeah, weird thing. <laughs> that now now I get that whole like like celebrity thing, right? When people meet celebrities, I guess they get all they get all anxious and, and nervous, I guess. I don't know. Um that's what I hear. 
I to, yeah, to me it's like it's less about the like celebrity factor and more about the surreal factor. Like, oh, this is we're here having dinner, talking about stuff that's interesting and I'm I'm having a conversation with one of the most brilliant minds in the field, right? And um it was just one of those and moments. Yet you, yeah. And yet you could be one of those next per, next generation incredible minds that people could be coming to you in 20 years, right? Sure. Yeah, who knows. Exactly. All right. So we're so, still on day 3. <laughs> I'm I'm bringing it back here. Um so we're still on day 3. So you got the free book or networking. What's what else is going on? Was that about the wrap up of the day or do you have a couple other things going on? Oh no, that's that's hardly the end of the day. Oh boy. Um no. So so the the very last thing, right, is uh they had a a reception at this art gallery. Um uh, a couple blocks uh, from the facility, and it, while art is is um, interesting on itself, um, what what they did is they introduced this incredible uh, art exhibition, and I, I, I've got some videos. I, I hope they they turn out. I looked at them; they're not that great. It's, it's just one of those things that I will do my absolute best to, um, express verbally. But basically what they did is they had this kind of planetarium type room in this exhibition hall. Okay. okay. So imagine this, like, imagine this like 60, 70 foot diameter, uh, uh, circular room and this dome above you. That's probably like I don't know, 70, 80 feet tall. I mean, it was, it was huge, right? They have all of these uh, pillows on the ground that you literally lay flat on your back and you're staring straight up at this dome, okay? Okay. Um, and uh, they had four different presentations um, and it was, it was basically visual presentations, but some were like auditory as well. Um, but just the presentations themselves. I mean, uh, I think when all of a sudden went and done, I think I looked around when they turned on the actual lights. I think there was about, I don't know, 12 or 16 projectors around the room. Um, because, I mean, it's a large surface area, thinking of how big that dome is, right? Sure. But when you're looking up at it, and they're, they're projecting these incredible images of, um, of light shows, and um, one actually showed these kind of like, kind of uh this hallway where you're kind of like you're you're kind of flying through at a very slow speed um through this like like big hallway um with with kind of gentle turns and stuff like that and then all of a sudden at the very end it just kind of quickly just goes really fast right back out of it and everyone is just like freaking out so Uh, is, is the field of view of this display so big that it encompasses some of your peripheral vision so that way you kind of feel like you're moving even though you're stationary on the ground yes it was absolutely like that so luckily i got in near the beginning of one of their shows and so i was pretty close to the middle of it and when i was kind of looking at it i was looking straight up and it was I could maybe see just the very, very edges of my peripheral view. The majority of it, I mean, I would say probably a good 90% of my visual view uh, was just at the dome. Um, and so you really got this immersive, and I was talking to, to some people right next to me afterwards, and, and we were basically just saying, like, it, it was just, it was almost exactly like the feeling of being in VR. Um, the, the feeling of this immersiveness where, you're in this room of, you know, a hundred different people. Um, and you don't even have anything over your eyes or anything, but yet you still get that sensation of like, you thought you were like moving through this space or you felt like when these uh, visuals were popping up and the sound was kind of going around you and the visuals were going around you, you felt like you were like moving around in this space, even though you were literally just lying on your back. Did you experience Um, any motion sickness while you were going through this? So I did not. Um, luckily, I am uh, I am very fortunate um, to not deal with any of that those sort of issues um, too bad. But I can imagine that anybody at all that would be sensitive would absolutely have some sort of issues um, with this because again, it was just it, it was the the sensations um, were just overwhelming as far as your 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 peripheral your your haptics uh, everything like that. Um, it was just a was really just like an overload 
um, for your for your perceptual system, but um, n- not in a bad way. In a, in a totally cool, different kind of you don't think of of I don't know um, of our field and what we do as this kind of form, but um, they they definitely took it to another level, and it was it was just something really cool. So that's how you ended the day on day three, right? Yeah, yeah, that was at night. Yeah, man, that that's got to be a good way to go out. And then you just went back to the hotel and passed out. Um, yeah, after a few <laughs> uh, adult beverages. No, no, no. Um, you, hey, hey, hey! I always refer to that as networking, man. No, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. After networking, after, after after a few key strong networking uh, <laughs> sessions, yes. Go back and listen to our HFES coverage, and I am always like, "Yeah, I was out networking really late last night." So much networking. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, All yeah, right. so that, that's how the night ended. But it was, it was just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's hard to explain. Like I said, I took some pictures, I took some videos. I'm hoping they kind of come out because um, just the experience alone was just something that was just so cool that I, I hope some people can kind of get an idea of, of even what I'm trying to trying to tell. Yeah, sounds like a real acid trip. Uh, not that I know what those are like. I really don't. I'm pretty, pretty, uh, pretty innocent as far as that stuff goes. It's weird. But uh, <laughs> we mentioned our Slack earlier. You're gonna post those in our Slack. Uh, so if you're just joining us, please, please, please join us on there. We post a bunch of interesting content. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get into day four. So that was today, right? Day four is today. Yeah, today was the last day. Um... It's been a, a, a long three days, um, and uh, as much as I'm I'm sad it's over. I'm I'm kind of glad it's it's over. It's it's very draining. It's it's very mentally and cognitively and physically draining, um, but it's it, it's just so fun um, that you just keep wanting to go back for more and more. So today started off with a um, a kind of a panel discussion, if you will, uh, for automotive user interfaces. Um, and the, and not only, not only automotive, but also the automation involved with vehicles. Um, and so that's obviously a very, very hot topic right now. And a lot of, a lot of discussions at, at this week, um, dealt with kind of automated vehicles and stuff, but they they had, they had six different kind of panelists come up and, and just talk for about 10, 10 minutes each, um, on kind of the different. Uh, stuff that they were involved with but um i mean i've got I, i'm not even joking i've got like a page and a half of notes so i'm going to try to skip over and, and just try to touch a few of the things but um some of the some of the real interesting stuff that came out of this um was that they're really trying to understand as a whole as a community trying to learn from other domains um what other domains really have used kind of automation um and kind of what have they learned from it right so obviously, aviation is the biggest the biggest topic um, right now as far as uh, automation and aviation. Uh, you know some of the issues that have that have gone on and and some of the regulations and policies that have come out of that. And so they're they're starting to really pull on on some of the stuff that that uh, um, aviation has done um, to try to understand how they can go forward with um, with vehicular uh, automation. Um. So were there any kind of like key topics they were jumping into as far as what they wanted, to, how they were going to go forward or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, they did. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the other, one of the things was, um, uh, so some of the bigger topics, uh, kind of this, this level of automation um, that they were going into. Okay, so was it? Were they like breaking down the typical levels of automation, or were were these kind of like new subsets? They were new subsets. Um, oh wow! And I can, yeah, it was it was kind of cool. Um, so, uh, Nick, do you have would no, you like to say something? No, the sunlight's in my eye. I'm trying to prevent it from. <laughs> ah, I see. <laughs> Looked see, like I was that's, raising that's my hand. That's where the, the the signals get mixed. You, you know, when we were talking, you said when you when I raise my hand, I have something to talk about. So I was you're sitting there raising it. I was I, I was trying to. Okay. Sorry. Um, anyways, people are probably think we're crazy right now. Um, they can't no, see so, us. <laughs> but no. Um, so Blake, to go back, exactly what I thought too, right? That the whole ten levels of automation kind of kind of concepts, right? That are that are very classic. Um, they actually have their own, and and um, 
I think I got a picture of it on my phone, maybe. If not, I, I know what the papers to, to reference. But basically what they were saying is um, th- that there's like there's like six different levels of these automation, right? It goes from fully manual to fully automatic um, self-driving cars. Um, and it, it's it's we're, we're progressively going. We're not we're not trying to just go all the way to the end step, but we're progressively going through these steps. And we're at like step like two. Um and uh, you know one of the one of the things um, that they were talking about is this kind of once we get farther and farther into automation, um, it brings up this really interesting um, uh, idea and concepts of kind of urban planning. Um, so you get it really into more of like civil engineering type stuff, uh, and also uh, vehicle ownership. So you can imagine if you have a fully automated car, right? Do you really need the car 100% of the time is it worth having it stored in a in a garage you know 20 or you know uh 16 hours a day or can someone else use it as well and you kind of have this vehicle sharing platform uh for these cars which then brings up the whole idea of well then would you really need parking lots as, or as many parking lots really as as you as we have now and could we kind of kind of put or uh, take some of these parking lots and convert them into parks or into other sorts of um, urban kind of areas. Um, and I, I just thought that was absolutely fascinating uh, because the implications are just, I mean, just, uh, just thinking about it is just incredible. Yeah. Down here in San Diego, there was a conference last summer called design forward. And that was talked about a, a whole lot because part of it was like having some of the transportation and vehicle automation people come and talk that are in San Diego proper. And the idea of basically not having personal cars anymore, but it, it becoming that self-driving cars, whether it be buses or just cars themselves or both, would be what's taking you to and from work. And it would it would change kind of how traffic patterns work. Like you talked about, it would free up a lot of space and stuff like that. But it, I'm glad that companies are this kind of research is being done and I really wish you, we would see more of kind of this stepwise approach they're taking. Like they're only at this point on level two dealing with level two, because I feel like with what all, what we're seeing in the news with different fatalities and problems with automated cars, like this kind of understanding of the public that it is being worked on from like a science perspective or scientific perspective would really help with maybe more of the acceptance or understanding of where it exists now and where it's going. Yeah, absolutely, um, Blake, and and I think too, and and you brought up a good point. Is I, I, I honestly, I think people are so excited about this technology that they're just jumping ahead too much, um, you know. And and that's where kind of the the accidents happen with these is is these people are trying to use this technology in places that they really shouldn't, or that they it hasn't been fully fleshed out um, and and worked out properly. But they're so excited about it, right, that they just want to go ahead and jump in full force. Um, before it's really been tested and really been understood. Um, and these people were basically just saying, let, let's put the brakes on here because, you know, let, let's make sure we really get this right. And, and let's really try to, to work on on making sure all the, the practices, the principles, not only that, but the regulations and the policies are really in place to really go forward and get to this fully automated um, step. Help me remember, guys. I, th- there was a prototype city. I, I believe it was in the DAE where they actually made they designed everything around these autonomous pods um, that kind of took you from your residence to these community places uh, and shopping centers and whatnot, all on these tracks that lied along the outside of the city. And then when when uh, you were closing into your destination, they would uh, switch tracks and come in. Uh, but the whole city, the whole prototype city was built around this concept. And I, I seem to recall it being somewhere near new, near Dubai, but I don't, I, I'm not, I'm, go- I'm Googling it right now. I'm not finding it. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Did we cover on the show? Because that sounds familiar. It sounds what you're, really, what you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, I think we did cover it on the show at some point, but I'm I'm having a really hard time finding it. So so maybe one of our listeners can dig it up, or or uh, you know, if if someone remembers, they can they can shout it out in the Slack. Um, but yeah, I remember that being a concept, and and uh, this this urban planning sort of aspect of it is is really interesting to me 
especially because I, I feel like that is a big piece that's missing from this human autonomy integration piece because it's bigger than just how the human integrates with the autonomous vehicle. It's how the human and the autonomous vehicle sort of change the paradigm for living in these futuristic cities where, like you said, potentially we don't need these parking lots. We just have a runway, basically, where we drop people off um, or... Or, you know, we don't have to spend real estate on these garages to store these vehicles. They're running 24-7 just on demand, right? And maybe they have, like, a sleeper zone. So when uh, the majority of the population is asleep in this city, they are kind of idling in places that are not populated, that have low traffic density. Uh, and and the planning of a city around these kind of concepts is, is really fascinating because it's taking more than just the human and the autonomous system that is the vehicle and trying to sort of integrate it into this overall lifestyle. And, uh, that's really cool. I'm, I'm curious to hear more about that. Uh, was there, did, did they mention any, um, cities by name or any, uh, sort of prototype, um, plans or anything like that? No. Um, no. And I think, I think the whole point of this was, um, Sorry, I didn't mean to be so broad. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> um, Nick, your hopes and so, dreams are so slashed. No, the, uh, so th- this really is at the the far right of of the levels of automation, right? That we were just talking about. They're 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 again thinking the future, far far in the distant future, of what the implications of going full autonomous vehicles are. Um, so as far as actually. Um, planning an actual city um with this sort of stuff there weren't really any examples um that they had that they they are trying to implement this um but um so so again this is like kind of the the far end of the spectrum but one of the other things i really wanted to hit on was um and and i thought was was really interesting that they talked about was this kind of while we're still in this transition phase of going from manual to automated driving right we have this really interesting paradigm of driving training and the whole concept of de-skilling um, for driving, um, which I never really thought about until they kind of brought it up, but it makes a lot of sense. The more... Sorry, when you say de-skilling for driving, what, is that, what, do they, what does that mean in their context? Th- th- so what they're talking about is... is um, decreasing your your level of skill for actually driving a vehicle so as you're getting more uh, autonomous vehicles and you're spending more time in the vehicle as a passenger instead of actually um actively driving the your skills your motor skills your fine your your ability to understand the situations to be able to um navigate and to physically drive the car those skills are actually declining the less you're doing them over time. And so what they're trying to figure out is how are we going to be able to keep people up on their level of uh, driving capabilities while this level of automation keeps increasing and increasing and increasing, Um, which just, I mean, makes total sense. I just never really thought of it. And it just, to me, it it scares me because I absolutely love driving. Um, And I would hate to be forced not to be able to drive manually. So people have this concept of when autonomous vehicles become the status quo, driving a vehicle will very much be like riding a horse now, right? We used to ride horses for uh, leisure, or, or sorry, we used to ride horses for transportation, and now we do it as a hobby. And uh, futurists are suggesting that perhaps we'll treat uh cars in the same way right where we will take them to race we will go out to racetracks and be able to drive cars themselves but they'll potentially be outlawed on the streets or or um yeah. highly regulated absolutely. yeah absolutely and, and it's funny because he actually one of the guys actually showed a um a sign in i think it was germany um where one of the objects basically saying no no skateboarding but it was like no horse and carriage on this road, right? From back in the way back in the day. Right. But he was saying, when will it be that they're going to have a sign that says no manual driving on this road? And I just thought, 
holy cow, that's actually not that far away. Um, and you can imagine that there could be roads, specific dedicated roads that do not allow manual driving. Yeah, or potentially, you know, in the interim, some sort of uh, autonomous vehicle only lane that streamlines yep. uh, transportation for those individuals who opt into that. I have a question right. uh, about de-skilling, though. So this is the process of, of um, uh, basically losing skill to drive over time and and how to deal with that, right? Am, am I right in that sort of recap? Absolutely. So I'm wondering about, like, is there the potential to reskill drivers from this paradigm of I'm in control of the vehicle to I just need to stay aware of what's in the keep the human in the loop of what the autonomous system is doing uh, and, and sort of maintaining that rather than um, potentially having to take over and drive. Right. Let's say you're in an autonomous vehicle with no controls for the actual vehicle itself, I mean, you still have, like, controls for audio, stereo, other extracurricular things that you can do in the vehicle, but not the actual vehicle itself. Um, is there any, was there any sort of talk about reskilling drivers for for potentially staying in the loop on these types of situations? Um, no, not really. Um, and I think, again, what you're talking about is probably very far on the right side of that level of automation, right? The fully autonomous vehicle where they don't even have controls to drive. I think, I think what they were really talking about is really kind of the whole Tesla concept right now where it's like you can go into automated driving mode, um, but you really st sh should still pay attention to the road. You still should have your hands on the wheels um, and obviously you should be right. uh, aware of your situation in case you need to take over. Um, because at the point of where there's not even controls to drive the vehicle, um, obviously that skill is going to be completely lost. Um, and therefore, you know, we'll be at the mercy of if, if that system breaks down, you, you're pretty much SOL, right? Um, you, you're at the, you're at the mercy of, of physics at that point. Um, and so it, it's, it's just the whole the whole idea of the less you do something, the less you get you you maintain that level of skill. Um, and especially, you can only imagine that whole takeover process, um, takeover command process, um, and how tough that's got to be, even currently, um, for people that are you know say driving the, the the Teslas and the automated vehicles right now. Yeah, I would love to know kind of what they envision that to be as little as a level of automation goes up and up and up i mean even right now with the with the tesla idea you should be pretty much in the loop because you're still all the controls are still there if you're like not paying attention then that's one thing but basically everything's the same except for the car is just driving itself but if, as cars get more automated i honestly like I, I don't see how people will be able to get back into the loop because i i can only imagine over time that as being a passenger you're just gonna continue to do other things on your commute besides think about driving like listen to uh, human so, factors yeah. cast i don't know yeah like that. <laughs> all uh, right so I, I wonder how they're going to deal with any of that stuff that's crazy yeah absolutely and i think that's honestly one of the biggest questions uh at least it sounded like from what they were talking about that they're dealing with right now is i mean how do you go from a driver to a passenger um in a vehicle um and you know that kind of process of gradually go shifting all the way towards a full passenger instead of kind of half passenger, half driver. Um, but, but, um, they did bring up a concept, which I absolutely love. Um, they're bringing up a new generation number or letter, uh, for new people that are, are being born around this age. Right. Um, which I, I want to share with everybody cause I thought it was awesome. <laughs> what it, is it? it <laughs> it's generation a, which for stands autonomy. for automate automation natives. They <laughs> they live they live they were born and live in an age of full automation. And I just thought that that's I mean that that really is where we're going right with with the majority of these systems and everything. And I just thought that, that was that was really cool as far as um, you know just the fact that we're at that point already. Um, so but but let me be very clear. Uh, the majority of them did say uh, we're we're far from fully autonomous vehicles and and they were even saying we're probably decades i mean two three 
decades away from having full autonomous vehicles within cities going around and, and, you know, doing this sort of stuff. So uh, I just want to make sure everyone understands that we're not talking, these people are saying in the next like three, four five years that, you know, the whole world's going to change, but it, you know, th- there is a process. So what you're saying is that there's some job security for students who are just getting into the field now for human autonomy integration, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and, probably now, and probably, honestly, right now is probably the best time because you can get in, make your money, and then get out um, for sure. Yep. But, um, but no, one of the things I wanted to, um, and I hope this isn't too deep for, for this podcast, but um, it, it got me thinking about the recent... Um, tragedies in Toronto, um, in uh, New York or New Jersey, I believe, in Paris a couple years ago, um, about people using vehicles as as weapons, of, basically, mm-hmm. um, and how automation in the future could potentially prevent these types of um, tragedies from happening, um, because you can imagine that you know a lot of these issues that have been happening, people have been going up on curbs, right, um, to to kind of maliciously um, uh, hit uh, pedestrians. But can you imagine that there's a case down in, in the future where cars won't even allow you to drive over curbs, that once they sense a curb, they automatically stop the car from going up on it. And uh, just, it really got me thinking today about about the possibility of kind of um, uh, of the possibilities of, of what could what could really help change the the future. Yeah, it's definitely timely, right? I mean, did they did they touch on that at all during the panel, or is that just some sort of connection that you made uh, just because of the recency of the most recent tragedy that happened in Toronto just a few days ago? And if you're un- if you're if you subscribe to Human Factors Cast for your news, uh, basically what happened is is uh, there was a driver who used. Uh, a vehicle as sort of a projectile almost to uh, injure or kill individuals. And, and it, it, it's an absolute tragedy, but I, I was wondering Woodrow is, was there any connection that was made to these talks? Is that something that they brought up during these or was that something that you just thought of as a connection between the two things? You know, uh, in this particular talk, they didn't actually bring that up. Um, it was just a kind of connection that I made. But it, it, it's interesting that um, being here in Canada, because, oh, shit, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Woodrow's having technical difficulties over there dropping his mic. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, it's, it's just, so being here in Canada, um, Toronto's actually not that far um, from Montreal. And, and you, I've been hearing, like, side talk conversation and stuff, and, I mean, you turn on the, you turn on the TV and it's just, it's all about this, this tragedy that happened. And, and I think what really hits home is that, um, these things haven't really happened in Canada very much. I don't think, um, these types of things. So I think it's really starting to hit home, um, for a lot of Canadians, um, and and for the world really, but just really kind of, um, bringing this at the forefront that, um, something needs to be done and, um, so, like I said, th- this wasn't anything they talked about, but it just kind of struck me as as uh, the potential for automation to really, um, in a sense, save lives. Where where the talk right now is all about people losing lives because of automation, um, but they're really not talking about the other side of the story, right? Of this could potentially save lives. Um, right. So I I just wanted to bring that up. Um, I thought it was really kind of an interesting um, twist on things, and um, you know, just. Uh, it gives me hope for the future. Well, please tell me you saw some other stuff that wasn't uh, so so depressing. I'd hate to leave our listeners on a downer note. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, and so uh, the other the other thing, um, one of the other things that I saw was, and and I think you're really going to enjoy this. Uh, it was called Thor's Hammer. Yes, I already um, like it. Right, great, great name. Um, Basically, uh, they used propeller-induced propulsion force to provide feedback um, for a device in VR. Um, and to give you an idea of, of what all that means is they basically had this cube with propellers 
uh, I think I believe two propellers inside this like this um, this cube. This cube was maybe I don't know 12, 12 by twelve by twelve inch, right? Um, and it had a little handle on it. And so you grab the handle and um, you're holding it. And basically, they can use a a system um, to provide force feedback on that to force you to kind of go any way that they want you to go, right? Um, and so to give you an example, um, one of the examples that they were showing was uh, you put this kind of stick in, in a flowing current like a river, and they could actually simulate what it was like to have the flow of the river on it and provide force back through this device. Whoa, that's incredible. Yeah. That it is, was it was really cool. That is really neat. So I'm I googled Thor's hammer, and of course I got in Avengers: Infinity War in theaters now, uh, and uh, going to see that tonight. By the way, that'll be great. Uh, but this this device is really cool looking. Um, yeah. So so it's it is essentially looks like Thor's hammer, except for the hammer part is a cube, and you got these propellers that kind of um, blow air out in any direction that provides this feedback. Uh, mechanism now uh, obviously there are some drawbacks with uh sort of this type of technology because it's it's very situational it's only for objects in which you hold like a stick um i mean or, or at least this these are the things that i can see right so um one one application obviously would be video games where you have a sword and shield or something and you swing the sword, it hits uh, somebody and you get that feedback, right? It blows really hard in the opposing direction. So that way it feels like you actually hit something. Um, I have no idea what kind of force is behind these propellers. Uh, but uh, did they talk at all about what kind of forces you can experience while holding this device? They did, and and I will say again, I feel like you're looking at my notes. Like I'm, I'm kind of worried about my camera here. Um, uh, <laughs> Woodrow, this but, this just always happens when we talk about VR stuff. I'm I'm super plugged into the scene. I, I've actually seen this before, and so yeah. I've a lot of things I've thought through already. But but I'm curious to kind of bring it down and and bring this information to everyone. So so you were going to mention the force. Yeah, I, I was until you went on that little tangent. Um, so the force is... I'm just messing with you. Um, so the force that they were able to create with these um, these two propellers uh, was actually four newtons of force, um, which if if you're at all into engineering, if, if you know anything about that, um, a, a good analogy is uh, take about a, a bottle of water, like a 20-ounce bottle of water, um, empty about a quarter of it out. Um, and that's, and that's about the, the weight of, and, and move it side to side and everything and, and up and down. And that's about the force of four newtons, um, which, you know, doesn't sound that much. Um, but really when it's, it's out of your control and it's forcing your hand, it actually is quite a bit of force, um, projected, uh, onto that. And, um, they were, they were able to do it at, at really precise measurements. Um, they had this really cool uh, setup to where they were able to um, measure the accuracy um, and, uh, and the uh, delay in which these forces were applied to this cube, um, or Thor's hammer, I guess. Um, and, and it was pretty surprising um, that they were able to do it. Unfortunately, the latency was one of the biggest drawbacks. I think it, they said it was in the in the range of about 300 milliseconds um, for providing that force back. Um, but still, that that's just kind of the start of things, right? And as we know, it, it's just about getting things to work first, and then you start working on the refinement part. Um, and so they're definitely the next steps are they're working on trying to make it smaller um, and, and trying to reduce that latency uh, for it. Yeah, interesting concept. Okay, so uh, what else did you see today? So the last thing I wanted to, to hit on real quick um, was a uh, uh, what they called haptic link. So it was um, it was another it was another project 
Um, again, this was also in collaboration with Oculus and Microsoft, um, who I feel like dominated the VR, the VR world in this conference. But um, it, it was it was very similar to the one we had talked about earlier with the haptic revolver. Mm, um, right. But what they what they did is they used um, they they wanted to look at a way of not only having uh, one, but they wanted to see what it was like to have a dual um, dual use of controllers to be able to use your hands um, and restrict the movement of using both hands in VR. Um, so a lot of the devices now obviously are single-handed and you, they're kind of free play and you can kind of move your hands however you want. Um, and there's no sort of interaction being able to use your hands um, together. Uh, so, uh, example of this is like driving a car, um, with your hands on the wheel, you're kind of, you're not locked to the actual wheel and where your hands are. So you're kind of freely moving your hands, uh, while right. you're driving a car in VR, um, bow and arrows or, or, bo or bow and arrow, which honestly was the coolest, the coolest technology they had. Um, but basically what they did is they created these three different prototypes to connect these two devices. And what was really cool is that they, they made it um, device agnostic. So they basically made it to where you can hook up any of the of these aftermarket um, controllers uh, to these systems. Now, I am not even going to do justice on trying to explain these devices because um, they are incredibly complex um, devices. So I will leave it up to the listeners to take a look at them. Well, um, and if... Well, I'm here. guessing that you have a, you might have a link to where you can find them. Uh, I, I I will provide a link in our Slack. Uh, I I do I will say that I'll try to give my best approximation of this. So much like the um, the cane troller had haptic feedback for the belt, this is motorized uh, pushback on the actual controllers that you're holding. It's an apparatus that actually hooks up to the bottom of the controllers and provides. Uh, motorized feedback in such a way that your hands are uh, linked together on whatever virtual object you are holding through the controllers. So that's kind of my best approximation of it. Like I said, I will post a link to this in our Slack. Um, uh, I, I believe, would Blake, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like we talked about this on the show too, at least in some capacity. We did because that name is super familiar. Um, it's because you called it Haptic Link, right? Yeah, haptic link, like by yeah. by by manual haptic links or something. Yeah, and, and it, especially since it's made in combination with Oculus and Microsoft, I definitely think we hit on it. Um, and, and you have a pretty good sense of it, it seems, Nick, unless you just like pulled that from the internet real quick. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I, I at least saw it in my circle of VR news. I don't know if we posted it on the show, but I feel like we did. Um, but yeah, as, essentially, it's just this this way to connect the two controllers in which there's motorized feedback to keep you from moving them a certain distance. And, and, uh, I'm, I've got the link posted in our Slack as of now. Yeah. And it, it was just really cool seeing, um, you know, the applications for this and, uh, you know, one of them, the, the bow and arrow thing just really kind of struck me, um, as just being a really cool application because, uh, they were able to use the tension on the bow, and as soon as you let go of the arrow, that tension released, and so you all of a sudden ha didn't have this force, um, this 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 physical force on your hands anymore. And how they were able to like release that and um, using using these uh, these connections, these these links, um, it, it was just really cool. And thinking of of going forward, kind of you know how you can use both uh, single-handed and, and double-handed um, controllers in, in a VR environment uh, is just getting better and better every day. Yeah. Well, uh, was that the last thing you saw for day three? Or four, uh, I guess? Yeah, four? That, is, that is pretty much... Um, I, I think I'm out of notes. <laughs> oh, I'm out well, of ink. Well, we sure exhausted you. I know you got an early flight tomorrow, so any last closing thoughts about Kai 2018? And would you recommend our listeners go to Kai 2019? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, it, the The conference itself was just absolutely fantastic. Um, really, really kind of solidifies my my um, my 
uh, interest in the future and what technology can bring. A lot of these papers are out of universities. Obviously, this is a conference. But the great thing about Kai is that a lot of this stuff is really applied research. A lot of the stuff that they're doing, um, they're actually working with collaborators um, in companies to actually develop these products. Um, and so you're actually seeing what this technology can do in the real world. Um, so it's just really fascinating to see this sort of stuff. Um, I, you know, if you do have a chance, I absolutely recommend anybody that it, that can and is willing to uh, go to next year's. I'm not quite sure where it's at. I'm sure you could probably find it online. I don't know if they've actually announced it yet where it's going to be. Obviously, um, it's it's a, a worldwide thing, so um, it could be over in Europe next year. Who knows? But um, if you can, I absolutely recommend it. Um, they also do have. I do. I believe they actually have a. Um, a way that you can uh, view the conference um, online as well, um, which they did this year as well, and I think it's at a reduced cost. Oh, um, so well, that's yeah, awesome. it was yeah. So so next year that might be a, a really good option for some people too, where you can actually view every single talk, um, uh, and you might even be able to uh, to operate those uh, tele robots that I was I was mentioning uh, last time, which uh, I have a picture of too. Um, that I'll post, but, um, yeah, no, it, it was a fantastic time. Absolutely love it. Uh, Canada's great. People are awesome. Food was good. I had so much poutine. It's unbelievable. Oh my God. Um, yeah. There you go. Hey, Woodrow, <laughs> really quick jumping in here. So it looks like Kai 2019 will be in Glasgow, UK. So if you are across the pond from us and, uh, have the opportunity to go to Kai, uh, go check it out. Woodrow seems to really like it. I got one more question for you, Woodrow, before we get off for tonight. Now, you mentioned that there was this sort of virtual reality racing thing. Did you have a chance to do that? You know what I'm talking about? What? No, I don't. You were you were talking about the yeah, like, you were Formula do, like, One cars. Formula One racing or something like that. Oh, the Vortex racing? No, man, I didn't. Um that was something I was going to try to do Sunday night or Sunday when I got here and just the travel all overnight and everything like that um i i just didn't have it in me to to do that i i really wish i did though i i might i, I might have to do it next time for sure yeah well we can count on your eyewitness testimony next time you're in canada for that well that's going to be it for our coverage of kai 2019 what did you guys think if you were there at kai and found something interesting that we didn't cover on the show you can always reach out to us you can follow us all over social media Head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Be sure to join the discussion on our SoundCloud or leave us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling saucy, want to do things the old-fashioned way, you can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you like what we're doing and want to support us, you can always go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank my panel for hanging out with me and talking about all things Kai. Woodrow Gustafson, where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about anything you talked about on the show today and more? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn or HF uh, Cast Slack. Excellent. Mr. Blake Arnstorff, where can our listeners go and find you? Oh, you can always find me in the Human Factors Cast Slack, and I'm on social media across the world at Don't Panic UX. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter or the Slack. I'm at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends. <laughs> <laughs>